Welcome everyone to today's Synergist webinar, EHS Air Quality Monitoring. I'm Kay Bechtold, Senior Editor of the Synergist, the magazine of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. I'd like to thank all of our attendees and especially SGS Galson for sponsoring today's webinar. Our speaker today is Chris Shepkoff, who is a National Business Development Manager and Subject Matter Expert on behalf of Industrial Fence Line Monitoring. He works for SGS Galson and is based in Houston, Texas. Chris graduated with a bachelor's degree from the University of Texas at Austin and has worked in the environmental laboratory industry for 30 years. His current role allows him to provide unique and innovative technological solutions for air monitoring to refineries, petrochemical facilities, and environmental health and safety consultants. And now I'll turn the present over to Chris. Great, thank you so much, Kate. Well, I'd like to thank all of the attendees for your valuable time today. My goal is to help provide a foundational understanding of air quality monitoring and then share some various uh, emerging technologies that are changing the IH and environmental landscape as we know it. So it's a, a real exciting time with the development of the uh, IoT, the Internet of Things, uh, really allowing for uh, much more data collection and faster data collection, and uh, there's a, a lot of advantages to this emerging technology. Um, so for air quality uh, monitoring, there are many approaches along with techniques, uh, and as I said, they're continuing to expand today. Dingu distinguishing between active and passive monitoring uh, will be one of our goals, so understand the difference of the two uh, monitoring techniques. Um, I'm also going to walk you through uh, determining your data quality and project objectives. Uh, those are very important to keep in mind, and uh, especially in the pre-planning stage. Uh, we're going to navigate through media and device selection. Uh, there's many options there. And then we're going to choose an appropriate sampling plan to meet your objectives. Um, we want to understand the benefits. Um, together with the drawbacks of each application. Uh, unfortunately, there's not one application that fits all needs, uh, so there's uh, advantages and disadvantages that have to be weighed. And uh, we're going to learn about the emerging technologies for real-time and continuous monitoring. The next few slides uh, are going to provide us with insight into the pre-planning stages uh, determining your scope, and also your sampling and analysis plan. So first you want to determine, you know, what constituents are you looking for? And so the common air quality contaminants, uh, of course, number one are volatiles. Um, there are so many different volatiles. There's well over 100 different analytes that are routinely uh, monitored. Some of the big ones uh, right now are uh, benzene, 1,3-butadiene, and ethylene oxide. Uh, these are always subject to change with uh, regulations that come about, um, but these are um, uh, some common HAPs, uh, hazardous air pollutants that people are looking for. Uh, we're also looking uh, many times for pesticides, PAHs. Uh, those are uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, um, a subset of uh, a list of volatile or semi-volatile contaminants, PCBs and dioxins. Uh, we also look at uh, particulates. Uh, that's a, a very common uh, air contaminant that's been monitored for many, many years. And uh, mainly we're looking at PM 2.5 and, and PM 10. Uh, silica has uh, been a contaminant of interest here lately. Um, the last year or two uh, has really been a uh, hot topic and heavily uh, monitored uh, constituent. We also look for heavy metals, uh, hydrogen sulfide. Um, I don't think I've been into one petrochemical refinery where I haven't gotten a, a personal monitor for H2S. And then we're also uh, looking for ozone and ozone precursors. Uh, those are becoming more and more uh, common in areas that are in attainment or non-attainment. Uh, 
uh, areas um, around uh, cities and uh, uh, petrochemical and refineries. The next thing we want to look at after determining what constituents we're looking for is we want to determine our uh, sampling times. And so um, that will help us determine in, in our sampling and analysis plan what techniques we're going to use. So some of the most common sampling times are grab samples. Uh, typically that's referred to a sample that is uh, collected immediately or, or near immediately. Uh, with a one minute or less collection time. Uh, we also look at uh, short term exposure limits. That's a 15 minute collection. Uh, time weighted average, which is an eight hour collection. Uh, many times in a risk assessment situation, we'll be looking at trying to take a 24 hour composite sample. Um, perimeter monitoring is, is a, a really growing application for air monitoring and perimeter monitoring could be up to or, or include as, as many as 14 days. So that's a much longer sampling time than what we're typically used to. Um, there's real-time measurement and that's a sample that's collected and analyzed immediately. So those are some of our handheld type devices that uh, will give us an instantaneous result. And then we're looking at continuous monitoring. And that is a sample collection over a long period of time, um, but with immediate uh, results that are provided, typically through uh, cloud-based computing. And continuous monitoring can be anything from, you know, it could be typically a day or a week. It can go as long as a month or can go on for years at a time. So. There's a, a range of time periods that we look at for continuous monitoring. The next uh, important area that, that you really need to look at and we need to look at in our, um, our, our scope, and that's our data quality objectives. And we really have to match our objectives with the sampling tools that we're using and techniques. So. Um, I've broken it down in a, a, a few key points here uh, to keep in mind. And so the first one is qualitative analysis. And that is a total concentration per media. So that'll give you a total micrograms or milligram per media. And qualitative is um, a very useful in directional sampling. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And that's where you're not as interested in the concentration, but more in a relative value um, amongst your media. The next phase and, and or the next uh, example here is quantitative. And that's what we're really used to. You know, what's my concentration per volume? What's my micrograms per meter cubed? And that's a quantitative analysis. And then uh, some other things to consider on your data quality objectives is, is this going to be used for regulatory compliance? And with that, you know, that's going to be your full QA, QC, legally defensible data. And I call that your laboratory grade data. And that's where, you know, you get your full QA, QC, your um, spikes and your duplicates and you know, that's something you're able to go to court on and, you know, should be legally defensible. Uh, that's the regulatory compliance aspect. And then there's the screening aspect. And that's a lesser quality of data, but it's, it's good data. And so you really have to determine, you know, what your purpose of the data is because screening, although it's not as um, legally defensible, there is a tremendous amount of power in seeing your data over a time period. And so your screening is more for a continuous monitoring. And, you know, you're probably not going to want to go to court on that data, but it provides and has a, um, a very useful place in our industry. 
And as I said, to see your data over time uh, allows you to monitor and to track and to see when events are occurring over a time period. And that's just hard to capture over a composite sample uh, or a bunch of different grab samples. And so really the only way to see your data over time is, is through continuous monitoring. And so there's, there's a real um, a need for continuous monitoring. So the basic definition of air quality monitoring, and, and it's, uh, it's performed to measure the amount of pollution in the air at a given place over a given time. And traditionally, there's two ways of air quality monitoring. One is passive sampling and the other is active. And so, um, as I said, the advantages and drawbacks, they, they all have them. So, um, passive sampling has uh, some advantages that it's really, you know, fairly simple, uh, should not require a technician or a chemist, and it's relatively inexpensive. Um, there's no electrical power uh, requirement, so they, um, you know, very simple to use, uh, intrinsically safe. Um, they're ideal for remote areas where security or vandalism may be a concern. And uh, the pollutant, it's a, a real simple process. The pollutant is ad adsorbed from the air through a diffusive body onto a sample specific collection media. So there's different media depending on the contaminants that we're looking for. And simply put, the air diffuses onto that media and there are known uptake rates. And uh, after determining the concentration on the media and factoring in the uptake rate, you get your quantitative result, so many micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, generally, for passive sampling, samples are sent to the laboratory for analysis, and the concentration is calculated based on mass and sample volume. Most commonly, passive sampling is used for uh, sample periods ranging from 15 minutes to two weeks. So uh, you're not going to take a grab sample uh, passively. Active sampling is generally a little more complex and uh, more expensive. It relies on electricity, uh, battery, or solar power. It's uh, not very ideal for remote areas. And uh, active sampling works due to the pollutant is being pumped across a sample specific media and is detected using uh, electronic methods or collected onto a sample media. Also, active sampling um, encompasses canisters. So a canister may be sent out with um, under a vacuum and uh, it is opened up and the sample is drawn into the sample canister, and that's also active sampling. Samples can be sent to the laboratory for analysis, or they can be collected and analyzed automatically. Uh, so this uh, active sampling can be uh, real-time and continuous uh, because there's pumps involved, um, and that data is available immediately or the sample can be drawn through a filter or another media and sent off to the laboratory and analyzed. So the most common uh, sampling periods um, for active sampling range from one minute to 24 hours, and then continuous sampling that can range from days to uh, a period of a year or more. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and take a deeper dive into passive and active sampling. So as I had uh, mentioned, act, uh, passive sampling is accomplished when air enters a device by diffusing onto an adsorbent media. And 
And then, uh, so these are examples of some of the usual suspects of passive samplers. And so there's uh, badges, there's radiello, air samplers, thermal desorption, or TD tubes, and then directional samplers. So we'll take a look at each of these individually. So badges um, are very simple to use. They are reliable. They're portable. They're able to be used for personal monitoring and also area monitoring. And uh, so you take the badge out of its uh, container, you pin it to your personnel um, or put it in an area and it just works through uh, diffusion. So there's no pumps, no calibration, very simple. You leave the badge exposed for a period of time, 15 minutes, eight hours, uh, whatever your sampling period is, and then you go ahead and uh, package that up and send it off to the laboratory. So there's not a whole bunch that can go wrong with a badge. It's, it's very simple to use. A uh, radiello sampler is very similar to a badge. Um, it has the same benefits as a badge, but it has some added advantages. Um, so the added advantages to these type of samplers are lower reporting limits, uh, higher capacity, and it has a faster uptake rate. And so uh, the advantages of the radiello air sampler is due to its design. So it has a three-dimensional cylindrical design. And so that allows for these faster uptakes, lower reporting limits, and higher capacity uh, due to the surface area. So there are some real advantages uh, to these samplers. The next are thermal desorption or TD tubes. And uh, we'll get into these tubes. They can be used for passive or active sampling. And uh, in this example, what we're going to talk about now is using them as passive samplers. And so the TD tube um, works with a diffusion cap. And uh, the picture here of the TD tubes shows them with uh, what they call the long-term storage caps. And so right now, the the tubes in this condition are not collecting any samples. They're um, protected from the um, environment right now. And so when you get these tubes, what you would do in the passive sampling mode is that you would remove one end of this tube. And it's important which end you remove. Uh, there are, there is an arrow on each of these tubes and that shows which way the airflow is supposed to go. And uh, inside of these tubes are activated carbon. And so there's activated carbon in there. So you want to remove the proper end of the tube and put a diffusion cap on there. And then that allows the contaminant to be adsorbed onto the media with a known uptake rate. So for TD tubes, there's Oh, maybe 20 or 30 analytes that they have known uptake rates for. So benzene will uptake at a different rate than 1,3-butadiene, and 1,3-butadiene will have a different uptake rate to toluene. It's all detect, uh, based on molecular weight. TD tubes are um, an excellent uh, media for collecting over a um, extended period of sampling. So typically these are used for 14-day samples, and uh, these have really gained momentum with the EPA 325 benzene fence line monitoring. So there's a requirement for uh, petroleum refineries to monitor for benzene on their fence line. And uh, this has been the um, media of choice, the sample technique of choice uh, due to being simple, relatively inexpensive, uh, they're good for 
extended periods of time. So these tubes are placed out on the fence line every 14 days and uh, collected and then uh, another set of tubes is deployed and those are in rotation and that's for continuous monitoring. And uh, the TD tubes are great because they can collect not only the volatiles, but they can also collect a lot of semi-volatiles. Um, so it's very uh, versatile media for collecting um, both of those type of contaminants. And another advantage of TD tubes is that they're reusable. So once they're analyzed, uh, they are conditioned. So they go in um, after analysis, they're heated up, uh, cleaned up and conditioned, contaminants and moisture are removed, and then they're able to be reused. And uh, so that's a real cost-effective way um, to use these as they're reusable. Passive samplers can also be used as directional samplers. <laughs> so directional samplers have a um, unique purpose. So they uh, typically, the directional samplers that I have come across are typically give you qualitative data. So they won't give you, you know, if you're trying to get your uh, TWA or your, you know, short-term exposure limits, this is not going to be the tool to use. But if you do want to find the direction of your emission source, this is a really great tool. So directional samplers, they're passive and directional, so no electricity, no pumps. Uh, the example I have here is a, a directional sampler um, that was created by Lancaster University uh, in, in uh, the United Kingdom. And it was developed in conjunction with the Environment Agency. So that would be the equivalent of our EPA. And uh, what they wanted to do is create a tool to hunt down fugitive emissions. And um, so this tool will point to the source of your um, fugitive emission. And I'll go ahead and walk you through how that works. So this directional sampler, um, they've called it the shark's shaped sampler, hunts down fugitive emissions. And how that works is it, it acts like a wind vane. So this is a very simple technology, but it doesn't mean that it's not powerful. So this um, sharp shaped sampler spins around in the wind. So the tail acts like a wind vane and uh, as the air blows across this device, uh, it's always in line with the direction of the wind. And uh, so the sample is collected um, through the mouth of the device and then deposited on the inside. There's a carousel with 12 sample ports. And in this example, uh, what they were able to do is they put in uh, sponges and they were looking for particulate matter. And this is just a real good visual representation of what they found on this sampler. So as the, the shark sampler spins around, the air comes in and gets deposited in one of these 12 sample ports. And so as you can see on um, uh, the picture off to the left, there's higher concentrations of particulate matter in some of these ports relative to others. And so this will point to the source of the emission. So, um, you know, in this example here, if um, uh, up was north, then you can see at nine o'clock there on the west side, there are, you know, certainly higher concentrations over there uh, relative to other ports uh, in this shark sampling. Directional samplers, and uh, particularly this one, um, allows for different kind of sample media. So you can put in sponges for particulates. 
You can also put in charcoal wafers if you're looking for volatiles. And so you can, you know, put in different media. You could put in uh, treated wafers and look for other constituents like uh, NO2 or SO2. Uh, so there's a variety of contaminants that can be determined from this one sampler just by changing out the media. Uh, in this example here, um, there were charcoal wafers put into this shark sampler and uh, it was loaded up into a software package for uh, easy visualization of the vectors of contamination. And so this software package uh, here that's depicted, you can pull up a Google Maps of your area. Um, the sharks are identified by uh, lat and long, so you know where the shark is placed on your facility. The shark spins around, collects volatile samples, send it off to the laboratory. And then uh, just like in the dust example, there's higher concentrations of volatiles relative to others. Uh, so this software package uh, puts in the concentrations, will help draw vectors, and help you to pinpoint your emission source. And um, it's really interesting if you put multiple uh, directional samplers, what you'll find is that these vectors of concentration will start crossing each other and really pinpoint a source. And so it can be a very useful tool uh, for determining uh, your fugitive emission source. And I think folks have learned that um, the TD tubes, although they're used for fence line monitoring, are very good for concentration. They're not very good for direction. And uh, typically people were looking at their wind rows, um, which shows you your wind direction and wind speed throughout your sampling period, and just kind of initially assuming well, my prevailing wind and most of my wind is coming from a certain direction, so that has to be where my source is coming from. But as these directional samplers have shown, that may not be the case. You may have an emission source that is not from your prevailing wind direction. And the shark samplers work because, you know, believe it or not, although you do have a prevailing wind direction, Throughout the sampling period, be it through storms or the evening or the day or, you know, the wind will move around uh, sufficiently enough to collect a sample from every direction. And so it's able to determine concentrations of sources other than the prevailing wind direction. Next, we'll go ahead and get into the active sampling. So active sampling is performed by drawing air through an adsorbent media, filter, it can even be a solution, or a vessel, and it's typically used uh, with an air pump, or as I said, in a canister, it could be under vacuum. So active samplers primarily consist of filters, uh, gas sampling vessels, adsorbent tubes. So adsorbent tubes are broken into two categories. It would be thermal desorption tubes and then solvent desorption tubes. And I'll explain the difference of those um, here shortly. Um, another common active sampler is a puff sampler. That's a polyurethane foam puff sampler, and then there's impingers and bubblers. So looking at each of these a, a little bit more in depth, um, so for active sampling, the filters, uh, hopefully you have a fully charged and calibrated pump with you and that you're able to uh, set up the device, uh, hook up the media um, to the sample pump, and then turn it on. And what you're doing is you're drawing the air through the filter media, and this allows you to collect the contaminant onto the media. So you're not collecting the whole air sample, 
uh, you're pulling the whole air sample and just collecting the contaminant onto the filter or sample media. Filters are typically used for particulate matter. Uh, they're used for heavy metals, asbestos, and silica. The next active sampler is um, the category of gas sampling vessels. And um, as I mentioned, these allow you to collect the whole air sample. You're not just collecting and filtering out the contaminant, you're collect collecting the whole air. Um, and this has its drawbacks because along with collecting the whole air sample, you're also collecting the humidity that comes with the whole air sample. And uh, from where I'm at in the Gulf Coast, um, you know, we have very humid days here and uh, it creates issues when you collect moisture into uh, one of these sample canisters. Um, but there are advantages uh, to canister sampling. Uh, typically canisters and uh, whole gas sampling vessels are used to collect volatile organic compounds. Uh, it has a nice broad range of collection times. So you can pull your grab sample, uh, that's something in a minute or less, or it allows you um, with a regulator and an orifice to go ahead and collect a longer term sample, uh, eight hours or even 24 hours uh, is a common sampling time for um, canister sampling. Um, one of the drawbacks with these is that uh, the six liter cans, they uh, take up a lot of space and especially when you're shipping. So shipping um, becomes um, a higher expense. Um, the industry and instrumentation is developed to where we get lower detection limits. So now uh, many times people will take a, a sample and are able to collect a sample uh, into a mini can. And these are much smaller um, sample vessels. And um, so the shipping uh, costs are reduced and the handling and transportation just a, a lot more convenient with the mini cans. And now that the instruments are able to detect lower concentrations, uh, you're able to meet your data quality objectives um, and save on shipping costs. Um, the vessels uh, not only contain canisters, but they also contain uh, gas sample bags. And uh, so there's a variety of um, bags that are out there um, that are able to collect uh, gas samples. Uh, those are a little bit more convenient um, as far as being bulky, um, but there are drawbacks with the sample bags. Uh, they do have a shorter holding time and uh, they're a little tougher to ship um, by air because of the pressure, pressure differential um, in flight. And so what, um, what occurs is that uh, the sample bag, you cannot collect a, a full sample into the bag, you have to leave room in there. So when it goes up into an airplane at a different pressure, um, the sample bag is able to expand and not bust. Um, so uh, there's some drawbacks there, advantages and drawbacks with, uh, with these different uh, sampling vessels. And then there's glass bulbs and basically you're collecting that into a glass container. The other group of active samplers are adsorbent tubes and uh, those are broken down into two categories. So there's the TD tubes, thermal desorption tubes, and they can be used as active samplers as well as passive. So the TD tubes can be hooked up to a sample pump and you pull a known volume across the um, TD tube and that will give you your qualitative data. And so you don't use a diffusion cap uh, where you would have the diffusion cap, you actually hook up your sample pump and collect the sample. And they're called thermal desorption tubes because they work by 
thermal desorption. So that tube with the charcoal media um, inside of it gets put onto an instrument and that whole tube is heated up. And um, what that allows is for the volatiles and semi-volatiles to be released into the air. And then there's a courier gas that delivers that straight onto a GC column. And thermal desorption allows for much lower detection limits uh, than a solvent desorption. And so the um, contaminant doesn't, does not go into a solvent, it's heated up and then put directly onto the GC. The next group is the solvent desorption tubes. And again, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, one disadvantage is that it's a one-time use. You use it once and you're done. Uh, it does have a two-bed construction to identify breakthrough. And this is important because typically you're monitoring or a, a really great application of solvent desorption tubes is for higher concentration um, and higher moisture type samples. So um, for higher concentration, you're able to do dilutions um, because you do desorb it onto a uh, into a solvent, and typically that solvent is carbon disulfide. Um, it's a very universal solvent. Um, it will dissolve uh, many constituents that are looked for, and um, it's also uh, solvent desorption tubes are, are really great for reactive analytes. So you, the charcoal media can be coated and treated uh, to be able to collect the highly reactive analytes that you typically can't get with uh, just carbon. And so these tubes are used once uh, they uh, typically they're sealed. So there's a glass seal on each end. Uh, those are shipped out into the field. Uh, typically the ends are broken off and then now the sample is or the media is ready to be used. Uh, it can be um, put onto an air pump and then uh, the sample collected through there for a period of time. Uh, when you're done, you cap them off and send those off to the laboratory. The next active sampler category are uh, polyurethane foam samplers. These are typically used for organic pesticides, PCBs, PAHs, and dioxins and furans. And uh, typically puff samplers uh, uh, go along with high volume sampling. And so there are uh, techniques to actively pull the sample through uh, this media. High volume sampling is, has an advantage of having a shorter collection time because you're literally pulling so much more volume uh, through the sampler in a shorter amount of time. So it can really allow for low detection limits. Uh, it's a great use uh, for area sampling, a great technique for area sampling. And the drawback is uh, it takes some really large equipment. So it's, it's a little more expensive to set up, but uh, you gotta have a larger area. And um, so there are some drawbacks, but uh, typically, uh, puff samplers are used uh, to collect these um, other analytes where you're really trying to look at low detection limits. Impingers and bubblers. So these are used uh, to collect airborne chemicals into a liquid medium. So what you're doing is you're pulling the air sample through a liquid and the contaminant is dissolved into that liquid medium. And uh, water can be used. There are other liquid mediums to collect the specific analyte you're looking for. And then uh, these work generally by two different mechanisms. One is a chemical reaction of the contaminant with the medium that you're using, or it is physically dissolved and the 
physically dissolves a chemical of concern. So there's either a chemical reaction or um, dissolving, and then that can get sent off to the laboratory and analyzed as well. Next, we'll look at real-time measurement and continuous monitoring. And uh, so this is where some of the emerging technology is, is really coming into play as um, uh, micro technology is um, these instruments and sensors are able to be made smaller and smaller and smaller where they uh, are being converted from benchtop instruments into actual handheld and portable devices. Um, and then with the um, Internet of Things, uh, IoT, uh, allows this data to be transmitted um, up into the cloud, do some cloud computing, and make the data available uh, either on the device, uh, your handheld device, or um, the data is also available on your laptop, your iPad, your phone. Uh, so it really allows you to monitor anywhere from anywhere. So these devices can be out in the field, they can be across the country, you can be on the other side of the world and you can still monitor uh, your device from wherever you are um, just by logging in or pulling up your iPad or your, or your phone. Um, so real-time measurement and continuous monitoring Typically, this is active sampling because you are using a pump uh, to collect the sample, and it allows you to obtain rapid on-site results and detect episodic, episodic contamination. So the benefits and disadvantages of uh, these devices or these sampling techniques it allows you a higher frequency of sampling. So instead of taking a composite or a bunch of grab samples, you're getting samples every, you know, 10 minutes, every five minutes. You're getting data continuously, and that allows you to see your data over time. So it becomes very cost effective. If, it, if you're able to collect 100 samples a day on your real-time device, um, that's 100 samples that you're not sending off to get analyzed. So it becomes real cost effective if you're pulling and looking at a lot of samples. It also allows for early warning. So you can pull a sample, send it to the laboratory, and, hey, I need a rush or same day turn. You know, they can do that, or maybe even a couple hour turn. But these real time devices allow you to get the results immediately. So many times they're used for an early warning. Um, system. The, another benefit is that it reduces issues related to sampling, transportation, and disposal. Um, so this is really neat. I, I learned this by developing the presentation, but, you know, truly samples are collected and, you know, we look at the laboratory because they're the last one in the chain of the process, but, uh, you know, we often look at the lab and say, hey, these results don't make sense, you know, what happened? Well, a lot of the sampling begins in the field. A lot of the QA and QC and that sample integrity starts in the field. Did you collect a representative sample? Is it an appropriate sample? Is it the right volume of sample? Then you have your transportation. You know, sometimes samples have to be iced down. You know, at times they get lost or don't get delivered on Friday, they get delivered on Monday. Well, now they're out of temperature. You know, does that affect my sample results? And then you have the residual sample left over, so you have to dispose of it. So, you know, these laboratories have expenses and liabilities uh, related to uh, sample disposal. If you're taking your samples out in the field real time, you know, you don't have a lot of those issues. 
As I said, it becomes very cost effective when you're taking a high number of samples. Uh, you have a reduced cost per analysis. Some of the disadvantages of continuous and real-time measurement devices is the validation. Um, I think with this emerging technology that uh, regulatory agencies are going to catch up. They're going to need to catch up. And I would not be surprised to see more and more of these devices um, get approved, get validated, um, have the QAQC requirements that are needed to establish, you know, certain guidelines. Um, many of these devices are not um, approved or validated. As I said, they're used for screening and they're good data, but they're not regulatory compliant. But as this technology emerges, I can certainly see where, you know, a short time down the road that we're going to have validated, calibrated devices that are going to be accepted by various agencies. Um, another disadvantage of these devices are the changing field conditions. So, um, is it humid? Is it dry? Is it hot? Is it cold? Um, are we in a high concentration area where, you know, the concentrations are just overwhelming the instrument? Um, so there's, you know, you know, some challenges in the field and how to uh, mitigate the uh, changing conditions. You know, of course, here in the Gulf Coast where I'm at, um, in many areas, you know, in the morning it can be 50 degrees and in the afternoon it can be 90 degrees. And so that affects how these instruments, uh, the response times and whatnot. So really have to look at the field conditions and of course the same is true in, in cold conditions. Um, typically these instruments have a, it's a, there's a higher initial investment. So probably not very applicable if you're going to collect one sample because that's going to be real expensive. Uh, but if you're going to collect many, many samples, then it becomes much more cost effective. So the real-time and continuous uh, monitoring devices use electrochemical sensors. Uh, these are industrial grade sensors. Uh, some of the common contaminants are carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide, uh, ozone, particulates. Um, another sensor is a PID, so that's a photoionization detector. That allows for a broad range of volatile organic compounds. Um, PIDs are great for giving you a, a total VOC number, but they're not able to speciate individual analytes, so you won't be able to use a PID um, in this type of a sensor for uh, getting benzene uh, necessarily. You're going to have to have a uh, hook up the PID to a, a gas chromatogram to be able to speciate. Um, but they're very good and useful for a total VOC number. And uh, then you can use a gas chromatogram and that will allow you to uh, speciate your analyte. So that will give you the individual BTEX compounds, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, xylene, 1,3-butadiene. Um, uh, there's a, um, a large array of analytes that can be detected um, by gas chromatography and speciated. Hi, Chris. Is... Yeah. Hi, Chris. I'm really sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to let you know we've got about 10 minutes left in the webinar. And we've got lots of great questions, so I was wondering if it would be possible just to start wrapping things up a little bit. Yeah, um, I'm almost done. If I could have about 30 more seconds just to wrap up real quick. Great. No, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. So for the real-time and continuous monitoring, uh, these are some of the, the handheld and portable devices that are out there. Uh, one drawback is, is that they are susceptible to cross interferences. Uh, so you do have to take that into consideration. Um, continuous monitoring, 
Historically, we think of that, or it has been used for monitoring stack gases. Um, that uh, is what they call the SIMS, that's a continuous emissions monitoring systems. Um, currently, it is a merging technology, as I said. Uh, one device here is a, um, um, called a smart sense device. Uh, it communicates to the cloud uh, by cell or, or uh, 4G, Ethernet, Wi-Fi. You can get alerts on your phone and tablet. Uh, you can set uh, preset thresholds and activation to collect a sample. So some of these devices are also married up with a sample collection device that you can send that sample off to the laboratory and get your full QA, QC, uh, regulatory grade data uh, in addition to your screening data. So that's kind of a nice combination. Um, here's an example of a portable uh, GC. It's very small. This is uh, the size of a briefcase. Can give you results every 10 or 15 minutes. Allows you to marry up wind speed and wind direction um, if you would like that capability. Here's an example of a software package. It'll show you your data over a time period. Again, easily visualize what's going on. Uh, your concentration and wind direction. And if you have any further questions, you're welcome to contact me. And we'll be glad to go ahead and answer some of your questions now. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, looks like we have about seven minutes left for questions, so I'll get in as many of these as I can. Uh, the first question I have says, uh, ACGIH limits are increasingly low and air sampling methods are needed to verify compliance at these very low levels. How does your company adapt quickly to meet these needs for existing customers? Right, so that's the laboratory challenge is always um, get using instruments and techniques that allow us to uh, get down to those low levels. And as instrumentation improves and instrumentation is updated, um, and uh, sample extraction techniques are able to uh, allow us to get down to those low levels. Okay, great. Uh, the next question I have comes from Ryan who asks, how would you define fence line monitoring? So fence line monitoring is uh, literally monitoring done on the fence line. And so um, if you want information on fence line monitoring, EPA, has uh, published a, a method, it's EPA 325, and that uh, goes into in-depth sampling on the fence line. But uh, generally, refineries have to monitor for benzene on their perimeter. So literally on their outside fence line, they set up these monitors, they're typically placed in a, a small shelter to protect them from the elements and um, the fence line monitoring is on the perimeter. Okay, great, thanks. The next question I have is, are assumptions regarding uptake rates, oh, sorry, are assumptions regarding uptake rates as related to air movement or personnel movement important to account for when interpreting passive sampler results? That's a good question. I do know that Uptake rates are determined in field or in laboratory conditions, and so there's studies that have been done. Um, I would like to um, get that question and pose it to some of the folks on my team, and we'll be glad to post the result as to the effects of um, wind and personal personnel moving around. But I do know that uptake rates are determined um, for specific analytes and the diffusion. And I'm not sure what the other effects are, but um, I would like to take that back to my team. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, the next question I have is, how much would one rely on passive sampling? So passive sampling is very reliable. It, it has been around. It's well studied, 
Uh, passive sampling is a very um, known entity and very reliable. Um, so passive sampling is a, a really proven technique. Okay, great. The next question I have is, can directional samplers be used in emergency response? Uh, this person is thinking fire and chemical release. Uh, do they have calorimetric wafers that can be used? Ah, very interesting. I will have to, again, defer to my team on that. Um, typically, I would say that it's not a good application for emergency response because typically the, it, um, although the media doesn't have a diffusion barrier, so it does uh, collect the sample faster, it's typically used over a period of time. So it's a continuous monitor, and I'm, I'm not sure if it would be able to collect enough sample in an emergency response uh, situation. So typically I, I defer that um, it's more for a continuous monitoring and not emergency response, uh, but I would like to uh, look into that application uh, with the color metric wafers. Okay, sounds good. Uh, the next question I have is, what is the best way to determine the appropriate cyclone or IOM device to select for respirable samples? Um, a lot of it depends on, on um, the activities going on. So um, there are advantages and disadvantages to each one, uh, as well as a, a slight cost difference. And so um, you would just have to um, look at the activities going on and suit the sample media uh, accordingly. Okay, uh, the next question I have is, do you have a recommendation for the collection of formaldehyde in a humid atmosphere, say 80 to 90 percent, uh, I believe, relative humidity? Uh, that's a one I would like to take back to my team and, and provide a response. Okay, sounds good. Um, Let's see, I've got, I think we've got time for one more question. I've got, is an air pump needed for impingers and bubblers? Uh, yes, typically an air pump is used, and that is to draw the sample through the, um, the media, so yes. Okay, great. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, I believe uh, Chris's contact information will be available in his slides, and I think it was also uh, there in the chat. So um, I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. Uh, my thanks to Chris Shepkoff for his presentation, to SGS Galson for sponsoring today's webinar, and to all of our participants. Registration will open soon for our next Synergist webinar, which will be held on Tuesday, December 3rd, when Bulwark Protective Apparel will present a webinar on advanced FRAR concepts. Thank you all again, and have a great day. All right, this was great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. This actually concludes today's webcast. Thank you all for attending. The recording will be available at aiha.webvent.tv. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with this link, and please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts.